اللهم صل على the love of our holy prophet Muhammad one loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salam a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani r-rajim bismillahi r-rahmani r-rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana lihada wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana allah والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين أما بعد فكقال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وفرقانه الحميد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام را كتاب أحكمت آياته ثم فصلت من لدن حكيم خبير آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على Awaited Savior of Humanity Imam Al-Mahdi عليه السلام My respected teachers, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته What were the first social ills and challenges that the Quraysh practiced that the Holy Quran challenged and sought to be able to uproot? If I was to ask you, what were all the different social ills that were present at the time of the Quraysh? There would be so many I'm sure you could mention they would cover dozens. Collectively, this behavior became known as the period of jahiliya, the period of utmost ignorance. When we say jahiliya, we don't mean light ignorance, something that someone is unaware of. We mean that they were steeped in ill practices that debilitated their thinking that stopped them from morality, from being able to progress as a civilization, as a community. There are many, many ayat in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes their collective behavior. For an example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Imran that you were living as if you were teetering on the edge of a pit of fire. Allah mentions this in the Quran. Elsewhere, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, I swear by your life, Ya Rasulullah, innahum lafi sakratihim ya'mahoon. Most surely these people, the Quraysh, the Meccans, the Arabs, were living as if they were wandering blindly, intoxicated doesn't mean literally intoxication, as if they were drunk. It means the way that they were living was as if they were drunk. That they were stumbling around without any ability to protect their thinking. And whatever they were called to do, they would rush to do it because they were so intoxicated. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran. Now, if you are revealing the Quran, where would you start? How would you want to change a civilization with so many different social ills, different practices and behaviors? Where would you want to start that might be a significant enough point to be able to change their behavior, but also something strategic enough that if you were able to change their thinking, it could actually remedy many of the other problems and behaviors that they were engaged in. One of the main problems, of course, was their practice of shirk, was their practice of idol worship. And of course, as you know, the Quran is constantly calling towards Tawheed, providing rational arguments as to why shirk, idol worship, is so wrong and so evil. Amongst them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, 
that shirk is the one thing that Allah will not forgive. Allah will forgive every other sin but shirk. Why? What is so wrong with shirk? This is Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Is he somehow scared of a rock? Is he somehow scared of an idol such that it's such a threat to him that he has to say, I won't forgive this sin above all others? What would make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of the universe, so emphatically state the problems with shirk? Well, I can give you a simple example. Imagine this was your idol. For some in the Quraysh, they used sticks and stones. They used to carve it into an image. Others, they used to take clumps of dates, you know, khujur that we eat. They would take clumps of dates and worship this as their idol. Can you imagine how backwards these people were? Now, let me ask you, why should this be such a problem for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or why would a prophet of Allah have to address the practices and the behaviors associated to shirk in order to liberate a community from all its other social ills, Ills and behaviors? Why do you think? The answer is, if I can get you to believe that this stone is your God, is your creator, is your sustainer, can listen to you and respond to you, if I can make you close off your mind and your intellect so much, then I can get you to believe anything else. If I can make you think that this is somehow listening to you and responding to you, if you're willing to believe this, what else are you not going to stop listening to me when I tell you to do? If I tell you, bury your daughters alive, will you say no? I've already got you to believe that a stone is your God, an idol is your God. If I tell you to dance around the Kaaba naked, which they were doing then, as you know, clapping, singing and dancing, will you say no to me? I've already managed to close your intellect, your rationality to such a point where you're ready to think that a stone is your God, an idol is your God. There is nothing I cannot manipulate you into doing. And so, of course, throughout the Qur'an, primarily, the very first thing that the Qur'an had to address was breaking the thoughts and the beliefs around idol worship. This was the first. The second thing that Islam sought to break is something that we will focus on the rest of the discussion tonight. And in the order of revelation, we're going to be focusing on two chapters in particular, and maybe one more at a glance. And those are Surat At-Takwir, chapter number 81 of the Qur'an, Surat Al-Abasa, chapter number 80 of the Qur'an, and chapter number 6, Surat Al-An'am of the Holy Qur'an. And what I want to focus on and show you is that from the very beginning of Revelation, what the Prophet and Qur'an challenged in society in order to be able to make a huge change and leap within the Arabian community. And that was this. It was the practice and the behavior of the Arabs to oppress, exploit women and children and all vulnerable peoples for the gain and benefit of man and men alone. And you know this so well. They used to bury their daughters alive. Women at that time, they had no rights whatsoever. When I say no rights, I mean they were possessed, as in they were considered as items that they could inherit. If, for example, you were a son and your father died, you inherited your mother as part of the inheritance, as an item of belonging, as a material item. You inherited your own mother. The Quran has more than 50 ayat trying to stop, prohibit, and change the behaviors of men 
towards women and children and disabled, differently abled peoples, but particularly the way in which women were exploited and oppressed by men at that time. This, after Tawheed and the dealing with shirk, was the first social ill that the Holy Quran tackled, and it spent 23 years tackling it over more than 50 ayat, year after year after year, addressing the behaviors and the practices of the men towards the women. Now, before we get into some of the verses that I want to be able to mention tonight, inshallah, I need to help you to think about how revelation was descending, being revealed, and the relationship between verses and chapters. Yesterday, as an example, you will recall, inshallah, we looked at four surahs, right? Surat al-Alaq, and then Surat al-Qalam, Ahsant, then Surat al-Muzzammil, and then Surat al-Muddathir. May Allah bless you. Well done, Ahsant. Now, we didn't take all the verses, did we, in those surahs? We only took some of the verses. As you know, revelation occurred twice. When was the first revelation? to the Prophet ﷺ on the night of Qadr, the entirety of the Qur'an is revealed to the heart of the Holy Prophet Muhammad And then revelation occurs again. When there is an incident or an event, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the same verse again and tells the Prophet to announce this verse publicly. The whole Qur'an is revealed to the Prophet at once, so he knows the entirety of Qur'an. But then when the event occurs, it is re-revealed to him to announce that this is the verse responding or guiding this particular situation. Now yesterday when we read, for example, Surat Al-Muzammil, we're only reading the first six or seven ayat, right? The rest of the surah we didn't read. And it is likely that the rest of the verses are revealed later on at another time in a different position, in a different month, in a different year, maybe sometimes as well. So how do we know that this surah and these verses are addressing this overarching theme? Do you remember I mentioned that if we read Surah Al-Muzammil, we know it's the third surah, but then there are some verses that may have been revealed during the 20th surah, for example, right? That were revealed much later. Sometimes the whole chapter is not revealed. In most occasions, some verses are revealed, and then more verses later from the same chapter are revealed, more verses from the same chapter are revealed. How do we square this circle and understand that when we're reading a chapter, it's still addressing this overarching theme of what we were talking about yesterday? For example, Surah Al-Muzammil is telling the Prophet how to start his movement, which is his spiritual training that he would have to undergo. Our maraja and particularly our mufassirin, they introduce a particular science to us of tafsir, which is known as the maqasid of the surah, the objective the goal of the surah itself. When a surah is revealed, when a chapter is revealed, it is trying to achieve an overall goal. What is that goal? Our mufassirin have at least 10 techniques by which they use to extrapolate the ultimate objective of that surah. If I said to you, what is the goal of chapter 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah? As an example, Surah Al-Ma'idah, arguably, is the last chapter of the Qur'an to be revealed, if not the second last. So this is revealed in the last weeks of the life of the Prophet. What do you think the Surah is going to talk to you about if the Prophet is about to pass away from this world? He's in the last weeks of his life. What should the Surah which is going to conclude the entirety of Revelation, talk to you about. What do you think? Well, it should talk to you about 
what happened with the departure of the prophets from the previous nations. So that you know what happened to the Jews when their prophets departed them, the Christians when their prophets departed them, to tell you what? How to prepare when your prophet departs you. Do you understand? So what's the goal? What's the objective? What's the maqsad of the surah? The objective is to prepare the ummah for the departure of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. Now our mufassireen say that even if some verses are revealed at different times, earlier, during, later, still, all the verses relate to the goal of the chapter. When you read a book, and you're reading chapter 12 of the book, chapter 6 of the book, all the words in that chapter are relating to that chapter. Even if they were written in advance or written later, the author writes it two months later, he edits it, he puts it in earlier, he puts it in later, it's still part of that chapter. It's still part of the discussion of that chapter. And so our Mufassirin say exactly the same thing. As an example, His Eminence, Allama, Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Taba Tabai, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alay, in Tafsir Al Mizan, he says, even if he was trying to do tafsir of a verse, never would he allow himself to do tafsir of the verse outside of the theme of the chapter, the objective of the chapter. Those verses still related to the chapter. Surah Al Muzammil, even though some verses may be revealed much, much, much later, they still must refer to the goal of Surah Al Muzammil. The goal was what? To prepare the Prophet for his movement. Spiritual preparation, preparation for his movement. And so the whole surah is pivoting around this discussion. So this is how we understand this particular issue. And there's much, much more, as you can imagine, the Mufassirin go into detail of these things. Having understood this, you have a verse in a chapter, and that verse is headlining the chapter. It's telling you what the goal of the chapter is, what the objective of the surah is. Please open your Qur'an to Surah At-Takweer, chapter number 81 of the Holy Qur'an. Inshallah, it will come up on the screen as well. Chapter number 81 of the Qur'an. Verses 7, 8, 9, 10. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'll start from the beginning. It's a very beautiful surah. Ida shamsu kuwirat wa ida nujumun kadarat wa ida al jibal suyirat wa ida al ishar uttilat wa ida al wuhush hushirat wa ida al bihar sujirat wa ida al nufus zujat wa ida al mauda suilat bi ayy zambin qutilat. Very famous set of verses. Verse number eight. Or verse number seven, when the souls are united, on the day of judgment, when all the souls are brought back together, and when the female infant who was buried alive will be asked, for what reason was she killed? What do you think the surah is addressing? 20 points. Ahsant. Female infanticide. The systematic, rampant killing of baby girls by the Quraysh. Why do you think they did this? Why would they kill their girls systematically? What do you think? Do they just not like girls? They considered them worthless, useless. What else? Ahsan, what type of burden? Financial burden. Many, many verses of the Quran were revealed to address the idea that the Quraysh thought that girls were a financial burden on them. لا تقتلوا أولادكم خشية إملاق نحن نرزقكم وإياهم. Do not kill your children out of a fear of poverty. We sustain you 
and we sustain them. The same way we've given you rizq, the same way we've given you food and shelter, what, you don't think we're also going to give your children food and shelter? The fear was, number one, if I'm in poverty, women, girls will put me further into poverty. If I'm not in poverty, they will put me into poverty. Number three, they also thought, because this was a tribal system that was based on warfare, it was normal that when one tribe conquered another, you would take the defeated women and children as your slaves. When you understand slaves, you know what I mean by that, what type of slavery they would impose. So it was a shame, it was an embarrassment that if you lost a war, on top of that was the punishment that your wife and daughter and sister and mother would be put into slavery by the winning party. So it was better just to, na'udhu billah, bury them alive than risk this. Now this was first addressed here very early on in the opening several months of revelation. Do not bury your daughters alive. Do not consider them to be a burden on you of any sort. This is very interesting. If you look at the span of Quran, there are more than 50 verses of the Quran dealing with the cultures that the Quraysh had against women and the types of exploitation that they had against women. I want you to really understand this point. The first verse was this, that on the day of judgment, those buried alive will have the right to ask, for what reason was I killed? And you will be asked, for what reason did you bury them alive? It didn't stop there. The Quran had more than 50 verses across its chapters dealing with the behaviors of oppression and exploitation towards women. Shall I give you some examples? If you were born, the most likely thing is that you would be buried alive as a girl. If you manage to survive that, then growing up, the likelihood is immediately you would be married off. When you're married off, you have no rights. You have no ownership rights of anything. You cannot speak out, you cannot say anything if you're being bullied or violence against you or manipulated. If your husband dies, your son inherits you as property. And it doesn't even stop there. And it was the norm that the Arab men would force their own female family members into slavery, I'm not going to use the particular word because there are children here, into a type of slavery where the men would force them to sell themselves and then take the money from their own female family members. This is mentioned in the Quran. Do you understand the level of life that was like for a woman 1400 years ago in Arabia? Like, if you're born, this is the punishment. If you're raised, this is the punishment. When you get married, this is the punishment. And then if you survive all of that, your own husband will sell you your body and then take the money so he can go and enjoy it. This was the norm. This was the culture that was present in Arabia. I can show you verses that are far worse than this. Adding more to this, the way that they used to treat women. Open your Qur'ans, please. Chapter number 6, Surat Al-An'am. Verse 138. 39. 139. We'll read the verse and then I'll ask you what you think this is about. Everybody's there? Surah Al An'am, chapter 6, verse 139. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقالوا ما في بطون هذه الأنعام خالصة لذكورنا ومحرم على أزواجنا They say, who is they? The Arabs, the Quraysh. They say, what is in the wombs of these cattle is especially for our males forbidden for our wives. 50 points. What do you think this ayah 
is speaking about. Think about it. What does it say? They say what is in the bellies of the animals are for us men, not for our wives. Why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse? Fifty points is the only person who can take over Abbas. He's got three right answers from today. Irfan? Should I tell you? Men then used to prohibit women from eating meat and eating nutritious foods because they felt that they were the only ones who were going to have nutritious foods, they would starve their women of nutritious foods. And why? Because they said, we are the ones that have to work on the farms. So we're out in the heat. We have to work on the farms. We have to be able to harvest. So we need to be able to eat well. You go eat anything nice. You get the scraps of the scraps. And what was in the wombs, meaning the meat, and what was all the way through in the milks of all these animals, they literally prohibited their own women from eating and drinking these things. Can you imagine the way in which women were treated? I could tell you more and more and more verses. SubhanAllah. Imagine how many times you've read this verse you probably read Surah Al-An'am many times in your life. Did you notice this verse? <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testifies to the way in which they were. <coughs> now here's a very interesting fact for you. If the brothers in the AV team can show us the order of revelation, who knows, what is the order of revelation? What chapter number was Surah Al-Takweer? What does it say when it comes up? The order was number seven. What is Al-An'am? What was the order of revelation? When was Surah Al-An'am revealed? Chapter number? 50? Five. Can you see it? Yes? So there's a 50-odd chapter difference between at takwir and Al-An'am. Correct? Between chapter 7 and chapter 55. Approximately 50 chapter difference. Think about this very carefully. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he addresses the men and the way they were exploiting and treating their women of the community, did he reveal one verse and then let the issue go? No. He revealed and then he revealed again. He expected them to change their behavior and then he addressed another issue. And then he revealed another one and another one and another one. And more chapters even in Medina al-Munawwara specifically dealing with the exploitations and oppressions upon women. What do you take away from this in terms of the way revelation works? Dealing with the times. Allah addressed the behaviors. Like This is your practices and behaviors. I'm identifying them to you. I expect you to change the behavior. Allah was relentless. This is revelation. He wasn't supportive of women. The Prophet wasn't supportive of women fly by night. He wouldn't just raise an issue once and say, I, I mentioned it from the pulpit, khalas, we can go back to our behaviors and cultures as if nothing's happened. No. He actually addressed it systematically. And until and unless those behaviors were resolved, Allah would continue to reveal another verse and another verse and another verse until those behaviors were defeated. The exploitations and oppressions were defeated. You see the evidence. Across chapters, these issues were dealt with, not just once. It took people 20 years to change their behaviors. Allah didn't stop. Allah doesn't tolerate these oppressions and exploitations. Now, it's very interesting, isn't it? Because sometimes in our own communities, if we address an issue, we expect to address it once and think, hi, we've talked about this problem that exists. Sometimes, a speaker will come and say, let's address this topic for 45 minutes, mashaAllah. That's not the way revelation works. 
Revelation was consistent in addressing a problem over a period of time and expected a behavioral change and saw behavioral change. This is conclusion number one. Conclusion number two, think about this very carefully. Just for a second, put yourself in the position of the sisters, of the ladies, yes? So imagine it's the norm for you to be completely sidelined from a community. Imagine it's the norm for you that if you're born, the likelihood is you're going to be buried alive. If you manage to survive that, you're going to be married off at the age of three years old, five years old. If you manage to survive that, then you have no rights whatsoever. If you survive that, you're going to be inherited by your son. If you survive that, he is likely to sell you into slavery to pay off his own debts. If you survive that, you won't even be given nutritious food. That's your norm. That's your life. And then you probably die at 40 or something, okay? Now imagine this. Be serious. Really understand this point. Imagine a prophet of God comes. The prophet. Who would you like to call the prophet? It's good timing. Imagine a prophet of God comes and he announces, don't kill these girls. Not only are they not to be inheritance, they have full rights to their own belongings. Not only does he stop them from being exploited, he gives them the peak, peak of levels. He says, in hadith, the prophet says, the best of men are those who act best towards their wives. Heaven lies under the feet of your mother. Whom should I respect first, Ya Rasulullah? Your mother, and then whom? Your mother, and then whom? Your mother, and then whom? Then your father. Can you imagine? The prophet turns it on its head and not only prohibits the exploitations, but encourages and demands love, respect, and honor of women. Fine. Tell me something. If you are the women of Arabia, if you are the women of Arabia, yesterday, this is the way you were being treated. Today, now, in the presence of the prophet, this is how you're being treated. Tell me, be honest. Which religion would you flock to? Tell me. <laughs> I don't know where the men went. Yes, maybe this is why we find the Abu Lahabs and the Abu Jahls going the way they did. That's a story for another day. But where do you think the women went? Where? To Islam. Which religion do you think they were willing to sacrifice everything for? Islam. Which religion then would they bring their children up into with values? Not the values yesterday that they were bringing their children up into, of the idol worship of the Quraysh, but the religion of Islam. Tell me something. Do you think that they rushed towards religion? Do you think they were willing to give their lives for religion? Yes, of course they were, because they found the religion preserving their honor, providing them space to be able to accomplish their life's goals and opportunities. Think about this question. Do you see women here in America, in Britain, in Germany, in France, rushing towards Islam? Why? Is the religion in the way in which it's being practiced and offered to women today as protective as productive for women today as it was 1400 years ago? Think about it very carefully. If the Imam was here, if the Prophet was here, what do you think the way he would be applying these verses today in 2023? Whenever, whenever there would be an oppression or exploitation of a woman, systematic problems in a society, how would the prophet today or the imam today be applying those verses? There's still female infanticide across the world, India, China. Do you think these verses are dead? 
Is the Quran khalas? That's it. We just read it because Shah Ramadan comes and we have Quran darsa and then we close it and then there's no implementation of the Quran. Is that what the Quran is for us? Half of Arabia came to Islam in the space of only a few years because they found the religion productive for them, working for them, elevating them, sponsoring them, pushing them forward. This is how we understand the purpose of Revelation. Revelation then, 1400 years ago, was active in supporting people through their challenges. Surah Al-Abasa, as you know better than me, Abasa wa Tawalla, the man from Banu Umayyah, he turned away at the blind man who came to speak to the Prophet. You know why? Because the way that they looked at people, if that's how they looked at women and they exploited women, can you imagine how they looked at people of different abilities, people who were blind, people who were disabled, people who were deaf. It's the same exploitations, because that's who they were. After the addressing of the matter of Tawheed and idol worship, the second, second social ill that the Quran addressed was the way that they used to treat one another, and particularly the way that they used to treat women. And as a result of it, those demographics of society that were always exploited, always oppressed, when the Qur'an intervened and supported them, these demographics of society ran towards Islam. They sacrificed everything for Islam. Because if I am to die for Islam, then this is what I want to die for. This is the lifestyle. This is what I want to give my soul for. <coughs> The idea behind thinking about this in the order of revelation, the Taratib al Nazuli, is not only to know that this was the first and second social ills that the Quran addressed, it's to understand that this is how the Prophet and Quran started the civilizational changes within a society. Is the Prophet more wise or am I more wise? Is the Quran more wise or am I more wise? If you accept that the Qur'an and the Prophet is more wise than me and you, you will understand that if you want to be able to build a civilization, change a community, the first, first thing is to address where there is shirk, and the second thing is to address where there is exploitation, and particularly exploitation or sidelining of women. Because if the women are participating in the community, strong in the community, supportive, the entire situation changes within the Ummah. These are things that you and I can reflect on practically, and inshallah tomorrow we continue our series with what was then revealed after Surat At-Takwir, after Surat Abasa, and inshallah we will have more chance to discuss what happens next. Your homework is one thing only. Kindly read again the Order of Revelation, the website that we have shared with you, and read the next 10 surahs, as in just note, what are the next 10 surahs after Surat Al-Takwir and Surat Al-Abasa in preparation for tonight, uh, tomorrow night? Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salli ya Rabbi ala khiratika min khalqik Muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salam. Please raise your hand and join me in dua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the appearance of Imam Al-Mahdi alayhi salam. To allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. If we are to pass away from this world before his coming, Ya Allah, raise us from our graves so that we can partake in the victories of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, help us to fast better in this month, read the Quran better in this month, allow us to reach Layali Al Qadr and the day of Eid with our family, friends, and community. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In honor of our noble messenger, please recite one loud salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.